the eternal glory starts to become important. I'm ready for the next great adventure. And it's getting pretty close to what I feel at the moment. I'm being viciously attacked by a horrible virus. Not only that, I gave a disc with another sort to Ian to check for me this morning. Viruses, wherever you look, oh my. But in the meantime, I don't mind staying here and doing battle with them. Now Paul has said, be like a soldier, endure hardship for Christ. Be like an athlete, train hard with the goal of the prize in your sights. Soldier, athlete, farmer. Farmer, if you don't do all that a farmer's got to do and do it right, then the seed is not going to grow. So having learned the wonders of belonging to Christ, serve Him. And one of the evidences that these things are real is that when you decide to serve our Lord, wonderful things happen along the way. And you put yourself in touch with those wonderful things simply by serving Him in the Bible way, speaking of Him, living for Him, and so on. Now, this word elect. You know, election, we're going to have an election. Mr. Howard is going to the polls round about November. We may have an election and we choose a new government. Well, that's not what this is about, except in respect of the word choose. The word means choice, indicate, a choice. <coughs> and Christians are elect of God, which means simply, God has chosen us. Now, why, oh why, did he choose me? Because I'm handsome. Oh. <laughs> Because I'm rich. <laughs> Why did he choose me? Now it's a much misunderstood word. Our Lord is in the business of choosing everybody he possibly can. The Bible teaches that our Lord wants everybody to love him. Everyone. No matter who we are, handsome, rich, or whatever. Are there any conditions? <coughs> now that is not easy to answer. The Bible says that Christians are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's a long time ago. Ralph and I chose him in round about 1956, and my wife too. 46. 46. 46, yes. And my wife too. 46, that's coming up to 60 years ago, but mine boggles. I've never had any doubts from that moment on. Because, I'm going ahead a bit now, but when you become a Christian, a wonderful thing happens. The life of God comes into your life. And something supernatural is involved. And you find in yourself the capacity to live godly, whereas before you might have been a bit of a nuisance. And you find the capacity to speak to others fluently of the things of Christ with an understanding that you did not have before and many other wonderful things too. They show that you are chosen of God. Now why did our Lord choose me? Because I chose Him. Was there any merit in my choosing Him? Not a bit of it. My mother used to think that I had a marvellous ability to find sixpences, that's an old Australian coin, on the ground wherever I went. That's because somehow I always noticed them. Went round 
put my head down, I suppose. But when I saw them, I chose to pick them up. It would have been foolish not to. There was no merit in my picking them up. But when I picked them up, I was sixpence richer than I was before. That was simple and easy. Well, it's a trite illustration, but it's something like that in practice. <clears throat> the Bible teaches that every human being, all of us, are made in the image and likeness of God. <clears throat> and one of the characteristics, the qualities of God is freedom. <coughs> Our God is absolutely free to choose to do whatever it is appropriate for him to do. And he made us the same way. But something terrible happened to spoil that. We human beings find within ourselves a sort of a proneness, a willingness to do and say stupid and wrong things and to use our freedom badly and something goes wrong with it and we can't choose as readily as we might otherwise wish to do and at some point in time in the life of everyone the Spirit of God starts to deal with the person and spiritual matters become real at that time it doesn't happen in ordinary, everyday, mundane life very much. It happens usually in meetings like this. Spiritual matters become real. And the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and makes Christian things clearer so that the moment comes when we have the opportunity to act on them. And something inside ourselves says, I see it for the first time, and it's so wonderful that that's for me. That's for me. It's Christ for me. He's my Savior, my Lord and King. I'm so happy I shan't sing Christ for me. That's an old song that we used to sing. Now that's how it works. We are free. Our freedom is inhibited, restricted by sin, but the Spirit of God and the Word of God suddenly open up our understanding, and that's the moment of truth. And in that moment, we have the opportunity to choose Christ. And when we choose Him, we make an interesting discovery. Our Lord, who is timeless, every moment in time is now to Him, chose us right back before the foundation of the world. Now that didn't influence our decision. It's just because God is that way beyond time and space. <laughs> and we find that not only did he choose us, but he predestinated us to all sorts of marvelous things, to be conformed to the image of his Son. Now that's the sort of thing that Paul is saying. See it on the display? The gospel of Christ is preached in order that we might believe in him. And that is a choice. What follows, if anyone's interested to follow it up, is a list of the ways in which the word elect is used in the Bible. Christ is chosen by the Father. The word elect is used in those verses. Israel is chosen by Christ, certain angels are divinely chosen, and Christians are chosen by God when we trust in Christ. Now the act of trusting in Christ has no merit at all. It is merely an exercise of choice. Like if I see a dollar on the ground, how stupid am I? If I put my nose in the air and walk past it, I grab it and naturally put it into the collection or something. <laughs> right. To an eternal God, this choice is made in eternity past, though to us it is made in our present. Right, to proceed. Verse 11. It is a faithful
faithful saying. These pastoral epistles are full of faithful sayings before the Bible was written. The things of Christ were passed from one Christian to another by word of mouth. And they learned certain faithful sayings. If we be dead with him, we shall live with him. If we suffer, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we believe not, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Teach people these things. Now what does it all mean? Before we become Christians, we understand almost nothing. I remember the days that Ralph and I were in Trinity College in the University of Melbourne and others. I say this with great shame. I used to bait the theologues. I was a theologue, a ministerial candidate, if you like. Try and get them to swear. And I remember vividly. Men that have passed on now because this is a long time ago. They just used to smile amiably and let me do my stupid thing. But they weren't complacent about it. What they did was go away and pray. God save that idiot. And it's a sign of miracle today that he did. And we and a number of others the whole course of our lives changed. Dramatically, the whole course of life changed. And that change has been empowered and undergirded by Christ ever since. We died with him. When Christ died, we died because we are nailed to the cross. The Bible teaches our sin is nailed to the cross and gone and remembered by God no more. And that being so, we also live with him. We have a new quality of life altogether. Things which we are, were like Ralph before he was converted, absolutely obscure, meant nothing. Suddenly it took on meaning and we gained the capacity to understand them. My parents didn't darken church doors. They were great sports people. Sunday was the great sporting day, or one of the great sporting days of the week to them. <clears throat> and consequently, I grew up a, a thoroughgoing ignoramus as far as the Bible is concerned. But from then on, I've been trying to make up for lost time. That's a sign of new life in Christ. Does it always go well? Verse 12, not necessarily. But if we rely on him, then he responds to that and we find the grace to come through whatever trials are laid upon us. Whether we believe or not, he is still and always faithful. But the wonderful thing is that having been shown the reality of Christian things, when we live by them, he proves himself wonderfully faithful in the marvels that he does in our lives. So Paul says to Timothy, remind the Christians of this. Remind them. Now there's one last warning, the last sentence there on the display. If our Lord loves everybody, and he does, why doesn't he choose them for himself? Why not? Now there was a time when my wife-to-be and I stood before a ministerial person and he put questions to us. Wilt thou have this woman? Now that was a moment of choice. It didn't require any effort on my part. I simply responded, Sir, I will. And that was sufficient, and she will do too, and we will live happily ever after, as I explained before. But at that moment, I could have been indifferent. And I said, now look, I'm having second thoughts about this. 
Than they have ever been before. 